Welcome to the stage. Yeah. Okay, hi. Is it on? Yes. yes. It looks okay. on. So uh, this is joint work with Dana Dachman Soled. Uh, she should have given the talk here, but uh, since she's eight months pregnant, she couldn't make it. Uh, I'll do my best to give a talk, which is, you know, hopefully close to being as good as she would, but I'm sure I'll, I won't succeed, but I'll give it a try. Okay, so um, uh, like uh, the previous talk, we talked about uh, securing uh, circuits against uh, tampering attacks, and we'll talk about leakage a little bit as well. So let me give you, oh, this does not work. Okay. So uh, the, let me go straight ahead with uh, our results. So what we show, we follow the model of Bishai, Prabhakar, and Sahai, and Wagner, and we show how to convert any circuit, or more generally a device, to a device that's resilient uh, to tampering. Uh, let me tell you the model uh, that's considered by us and by the previous result of Ishai et al. So we consider an adversary who can tamper with the circuit by toggling with the wires, setting wires to zero, or setting wires to one, and we claim that even if he does so repeatedly, he does not gain any information. And the reason he doesn't get any information is because what this device will do, as soon as he realizes that he was tampering, tampered with, it will self-destruct. So that was the idea of Avishai et al, and we're kind of following upon it. Um, what Ishai et al showed is they showed how to do such a conversion. And the amount of tampering they tolerate in each run, the num or in other words, the number of wires that the adversary can tamper with is roughly one over the size of the original device or the original circuit. Uh, and essentially, the, the reason this happens is because the way their result goes, they say, well, if you want to tamper with T wires, very roughly speaking, what they say is we need to explode the circuit by a factor of T. And that's why they get one over the side. That's why the rate is relatively small. And the improvement in this work is that we get a constant rate. So the, in each run, the adversary can, factor, can tamper with a constant fraction of the wires in the circuit. So that's, in a nutshell, uh, our result. OK, so why do we care? So as Feng Hao just showed, you know, there's a variety of uh, physical attacks in the real world. So I'm not going to go over them. There's timing attack, power attack, acoustic attacks, cold boot attacks, there are fault attacks, radiation attacks, so on and so forth. Uh, roughly speaking, these attacks can be partitioned into two parts. There's leakage attacks, where in leakage attacks, essentially what you, you should think of is the adversary, the computation is going on, he cannot tamper with the actual computation, but he can kind of get information about, you know, a, a side channel information about what's going on. So by timing the computation, he may get some information, uh, by listening to the computation, and so on and so forth. And then there's another category, which is tampering attack where there the adversary can actually go and manipulate the wires or put radiation on it, and which causes, it, instead, what it causes is instead of the original computation to go on, something weird goes on. So it actually changes the computation. And in this talk, uh, as opposed to the previous talk, we actually uh, consider tampering during the computation itself. So not only with the memory, but actually during the computation, uh, uh, the adversary can, can tamper with the wires. Okay, so there's been a lot of previous work. I'm not going to go over it. Uh, actually, there's much more, you know, it goes down. Uh, the point is not to give references here. The point is just to tell you that there's been a lot of work, uh, much more on leakage than on tampering. And in this talk, I'm going to focus only on the tampering. We get partial results for leakage and tampering. I'm going to mention that in the end. But for this talk, let's just focus on the tampering part. Okay, so now let me try to tell you our results in a bit more detail. Uh, so <clears throat> we, what we show is we take, we show how to convert any circuit into one that's resilient to tampering. But in order to tell you this, our results in more details, I need to define what do I mean by tamper resilient? So what's the tampering model? And I need, so I need to tell you what tamper is, what the tampering model, and I need to say, tell you what resilience is, meaning what's the security guarantee that we give? Okay, so let's start with the uh, uh, tampering model, uh, which I mentioned before, but actually, uh, before I do that, 
Let me just uh, give a warning here. So uh, this is a theoretical result. Uh, the tempering model that we, you, we show here, that we do not claim that it solves you know, real world tempering attacks. It doesn't, actually. And moreover, we don't claim that uh, the result is practical. In fact, it's not. Uh, so what we, this, what we think of this result as just kind of a step towards kind of achieving the end goal. Uh, okay, so, yeah. so what's the tempering model? So the tempering model is essentially the one by, by Isha et al. So uh, we consider circuits, uh, when we think of a circuit, the way we model it, as they do, is we think of it as a uh, circuit where, which has some secret state, that's the memory. So there's some secret S which is in the memory. You should think of that as kind of the secret key. So you can think of the circuit, let's say, as a, a signing key, and in the memory there's the secret key that's used uh, to signing. And the adversary can repeatedly do the following things. So he can repeatedly send an input XI of his choice, okay, uh, as, as often as he wants. And moreover, he can also, with the input XI, he can send a tampering function. Okay, so he sends an input XI, he sends a tampering function with it, with it, and what is this tampering function? What he can do, he can, this tampering function just specifies a bunch of wires and specifies a bunch of memory location, memory wires, and for each such wire, the tampering function tells you whether he wants to set the wire to zero, set it to one, or toggle with the wire. And the adversary, what he gets back is the result of the, of this, this circuit when these wires were tampered with. And he can do that repeatedly. Okay, so that's, the, um, that's what we allow the adversary to do. That's the tempering that the adversary uh, is allowed to do. And actually it was already shown by Shaital that this is impossible, okay? And let me, I can give you, it's very simple to see why it is impossible. So let me tell you what the adversary can do. He can run this circuit many times and many exercises of his choice. And then on the same XI, he will run the circuit while taking only one memory bit at, at a time. And so we take, let's say, the first memory bit, set it to zero. Run it, now run again on the same input, see if any change happened. If nothing happened, then either it was zero or, you know, for practical purposes, it could have been zero because the functionality didn't change. And if it did change, you know it was a one. So you set it to one, and this you do kind of bit by bit, and you learn the entire secret state. So, the point is, Ishai tells you that this is impossible to do. So, you know, I, I'm claiming here a positive result. And the way they get around this positive result, this negative result, and we do too, is by allowing the circuit to feed back into memory. Or in other words, what we call self-destruct. So, when the circuit realizes something bad happened, what he will do, he will overwrite the memory with zeros. And therefore, if you do the attack as before, try to learn bit by bit, after self-destruct, you don't learn anything anymore. It's just a bunch of zeros. Okay. Uh, so that's the tempering model. We allow, uh, sorry, we allow uh, wire tempering, and we have this uh, feedback which uh, zeros out all the memory. Okay. <coughs> so that's the, oh, sorry about that. So that's the tempering model. Now we need to talk about the security guarantee. So the security guarantee of Ishai et al. is kind of the usual simulation-based security guarantee. Uh, for any adversary, you want to say there's just a simulator that, so you want to say the adversary doesn't learn anything beyond black box access to the circuit, essentially. He definitely gets at least black box access. He also, we allow him to tampering, but that doesn't reveal extra information, is what you want to claim. And the way you formalize it, you say, well, there's a simulator who can learn whatever the adversary learns with only black box access to, uh, to the circuit. That's the security guarantee we would like to give. We give a slightly weaker security guarantee, and we allow the simulator to learn log bits of leakage. Okay, and we want to emphasize that for practical security, that's not, I mean, you can guess it with one over poly probability. So if you think about, if you use it as for cryptographic applications, it shouldn't, uh, ruin security, this log, uh, many bits of leakage. And uh, the, what this leakage is actually gonna be, uh, this log bits of leakage will essentially tell the simulator, so the, the um, adversary is running this circuit many, many times, the simulator needs to know when the self-destruct happens. Once he knows that everything can simulate everything, he doesn't need to learn anything else. So that's kind of the log bits of leakage that uh, 
that you learn when self-destruct happens. And that's inherent, actually, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. Okay, so, uh, so now we talked about the model, we talked about the tampering, what's our result? So we show this compiler takes any circuit to a tamper-resilient circuit. Now I explain what tamper-resilient means. And the resilience is the constant uh, tampering rate. So we can fact that in each run, the adversary can tamper with constant fraction of the wires and tampering uh, gates. And the result is information theoretic. So we don't have any bounds on the adversary um, or any, any time bounds on the adversary, or rely, nor do we rely on any computational assumptions. OK, so now let me compare it with the work of uh, Ishai and Tal in more detail. So let me first do, start by the improvement, and then I'll say uh, the downside of our work. So first, uh, they get a uh, tampering rate, which is only one over the size of the original circuit. We get constant tampering rate. They use randomness gates. So in the temporal circuit, the, their gates ju just produce randomness. And they, or they can get around it by using computational assumption or pseudorandom functions. Uh, we don't need any of that. Our results is information theoretic. And we don't need randomness at all. So the um, conversion does not use, everything is deterministic. And one can show that if you don't use any randomness, then this log bits of leakage is inherent. You can't get around it. Um, so we get log bits of leakage. They don't. And also, they can handle persistent faults, and we cannot. Uh, OK. So um, good. So let me tell you a little bit about kind of more related work in this area. So uh, OK, one area that's related is the area of fault-tolerant computation. That's very, you know, there have been tons of work in this area, starting from uh, von Neumann. Uh, and essentially, in this area, people try to construct uh, circuits that are, that are fault tolerant, namely, they still, they're still correct. Even if there's some tampering, they still produce the correct output. They, weren't in, uh, they didn't care about secrecy here in this line of work. And then there's also a long line of work uh, on tampering only with memory gates. That's the work that uh, Feng, Hao, uh, uh, Feng Hao's work uh, is in this category. And as far as uh, I'm aware of, there's been actually very little work on trying to protect circuits uh, against tampering during the computation itself, and positive results on, on this. And so there's the work of Ichaita that I've been talking about all along. And then there's another work by Fast Petzak and Venturi, and they also get this log bits of leakage. So the adversary can tamper, and the guarantee is that you don't learn anything more, but anything more than log bits of leakage. So they also have this log bits of leakage. Uh, and, but their result, and they also consider only tampering with wires, but as, their result is essentially in the, uh, for random errors. So they allow the adversary to tamper with a wire, but then this tampering kind of with probability P, the tampering does not occur. So it's essentially like a random uh, error model as opposed to adversarial error model. Okay. So in the last uh, uh, four minutes, let me show you, give you an overview of our construction. So how do we get our result? OK, so the starting point is the idea of Ishayetal, where we say, you know, we'll take the original circuit, and we'll just add a little component that checks whether tampering occurred. And if tampering occurred, the component will self-destruct. That's their idea uh, as well. Um, the problem, which they had to deal with too, is that this component needs to be temper resilient because the adversary can just tamper with this component. So the question is, how do you get that to be temper resilient? And here's the key, our key idea. The key idea is to make the temper detection component in complexity class NC0. Let me explain to you what I mean. So I want this detection, this temper detection component to be of the following form. Many, many, many small kind of components, each of constant size. And the number of them is big. It's proportional to the size of the circuit. Why is that what I want? Because now, let's say the adversary tampers. Because each one is a constant size, and because there are so many of them, they're proportional to the size of the circuit, the adversary cannot tamper with all of them. OK, so the adversary can only tamper with some constant fraction of them. And now what we know is that there's some constant fraction of this temper detection com components that we're not tempered with. So even if the adversary tries to temper with all of them, he cannot. There's just too many of them. And since each one is a constant size, 
there's always, there's always going to be some, if you make the constant small enough, there's always going to be some that he, can, that he won't tamper with. And these are the ones who are going to overwrite the memory with zeros. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Of course, there's much more to it because how do they overwrite all the memory and, uh, and so on and so forth, but, but that's kind of the main idea. Uh, so how do I get this temper detection component of this form that's a bunch of, circuit, a bunch of little components, each one of constant size? The technique is what's on PCPs of proximity, uh, which was put forth by Ben Sasson et al. So let me tell you, I'm not going to define what PCPs of proximities are, but um, let me kind of give you, continue this overview of our construction. So what we do, we, our compiler takes a circuit and converts it to the following circuit. It first computes the circuit. So the, the temporal resilient circuit, what it does, it computes the circuit, and then it proves to himself that he computed it correctly. Okay, so he proves to himself, that's the PCP proof, probabilistically checkable proof, and the proof needs to be such that you can verify it by reading only very few bits of it at a time, okay? So if you just use what's called probabilistically checkable proofs, for those who know what that means, then you can, these are proofs that essentially allows you to read only constant number of bits from the proof and check. Okay, so here are all the components, each one reads constant number of bits, and, and now it checks the correctness, and if it's enough that one of them is not correct, then you're gonna self-destruct. And the idea is that, okay, because there are many of them, and each one's constant size, there are always gonna be some that the adversary will not tamper with, and these, the orange ones, are gonna actually feed into the memory and put zeros everywhere. Okay, override with zeros. Now, PCPs, as is, don't work, the reason is, they indeed only um, uh, query the PCP in constant number of places, but they query the input X and the memory S everywhere. Okay, and we need them to also query the memory in the, the S and X also in constant, num uh, constant number of locations. And that's why PCPs are not enough and what we need is PCPs of proximity. So I'm not gonna define uh, what these are, but, uh, okay, I'm not expecting to know, to understand, this is actually our circuit, uh, but be, because we, the PCPs of proximity, because they cannot access the entire X and the entire secret memory, what we'll need is essentially to encode the input X in an error correcting code, to encode the memory in an error correcting code, then we do the circuit computation, we do the proof, the PCP, the, uh, PCP of proximity computation, and then we have all the, verifi the small verification uh, circuits. Okay, so to summarize, uh, so we have a general compiler that converts a circuit C into a temper resilient one. Uh, we are resilient to constant fraction of tampering. Our results are information theoretical. And it also, we have a result extending con to continual leakage and tampering. But uh, I'll leave that for the paper. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>